Thank you all for your patience. Welcome to the Mini Corp Q&A episode number 15! No? Everyone excited? Nobody's excited? Um, what was... I wrote my other thing down on the on the other app. Okay, what was what was Patrick's question? How do you approach taking designs to functional spec? I think one without the other is like it's very very tough. You need both. You need designs, and you need to have a functional spec. The way that we've always built product here in MiniCorp is by first of all, we do what's called a MiniCorp workshop. The MiniCorp workshop is where we sit down with the client, discuss the idea, what the overall vision, high vision of the company is going to be then nailing it down into the MVP, what do we actually need to build, what's the minimum amount we need to build, saving money, saving capital, saving investment of time into the product so that we can go out there and validate the idea. The next stage is getting into wireframes so that the client and ourselves can get touchy-feely-feely. We use awesome people like Danielle on the other side of the camera to help us to do that. We then sit down with the rest of the Minicorp team, like the awesome Alan and Steve and myself, and we discuss with the client how the MVP is going to work, and we look at the overall visual designs. That helps the client to kind of go, okay, I get a great sense of what we're building here, I know how this MVP is going to work. They can go back out to the overall audience of the world, to their potential customers, and say, thinking about building this, what do you reckon? whilst we start to write up a functional spec. For instance, if you had one screen going to another screen without a functional spec that says, on this screen, this button does that, on that screen, this button does this, and here's the different types of functionality and how they, different, how they occur. If we didn't have a functional spec, what would happen is scope creep. The customer or the client can turn around to us whilst we're building it saying, ah, oh, no. I thought something completely different was going to happen there. Whilst we're going, no, realistically, this is the best way to do it. And they're like, there's a little bit of a battle. So a functional spec plus designs equals the most happy, awesome contract in the world. Question number two. Um, comes from actually the awesome Dez. What's up, Vinny? One tree, 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 tree. Um, what did Dez ask? He asked... How do you test mobile apps and their business models when it comes to a, let's say, free versus freemium versus paid versus subscription? Des, first of all, I love you, Des. Phenomenal question. The way that I would honestly vet to see what the best model is to use in the context of your app is, first of all, to know what the app is going to be. For instance, freemium models have been proven to work time and time again in a certain context. Um, subscription-based models have been proven to work in other contexts, so it's completely dependent on who you're selling it to and what and why. So Des, if you're there, please give us a little bit more context. A good idea always when, or something that I've heard and thought about recently when it comes to charging and business models and pricing is this. There is an amazing cinema that only sells two types of popcorn. There is a small popcorn and a large popcorn. Small popcorn is priced at $4, large popcorn is charged at $9, $10. Um, everybody walks into the cinema and they go, can I have a bag of popcorn? They say, you want small or large? They say, oh my god, look at the difference in price, just give me the small popcorn, thank you very much. They then introduce a medium-sized popcorn for 7 Every single customer will always walk in and go, I will definitely go for the medium because they want to share it with their partner or whatever. And then the guy behind the counter or the lady behind the counter goes, but why not upgrade to the large popcorn for $3? And everybody starts to buy uh, the large popcorn. The medium popcorn is then basically a gateway drug. There is a couple of books on pricing and business models and stuff that I will definitely share. Um, I don't know if we have them here, but they are around. Um, the third question, the third question I wrote on the way over here and I can't remember it. Everybody pause for one second, one second. Okay, so the question was, what builds a successful startup business? Which is probably the most generic question in the world. If other people have other questions, please ask them and we will definitely get around to answering those as well. So I think, I think me writing that question comes from the amazing meeting that I just had. What builds an amazing startup is completely the team. And it's all around making sure that you attract the right talent and that you're out there 
promoting, talking about, and discussing your business as much as possible. For instance, the only way that Minicorp is going to attract phenomenal people like Danielle and Alan and Steve is by ensuring that we are building phenomenal products all of the time. As we scale this business and as we start to talk about more equity side of it and less about just cash deals the entire time, this becomes even more enticing to the people that we're going to hire and that we have hired already. So what makes a phenomenal team is, is people that are product hungry, especially in my space, in, in the mini course space, you got to want to understand what the different products and types of products there are out in the world, challenge products consistently and all of the time, and then also want to build amazing products and for people to use them. There should be nothing more enlightening to yourself than when somebody picks up something that you have handcrafted yourself and built and designed and knowing that there is X amount of people in the world that are using it on a daily basis and have fall, fallen in love with what you've done. Um, and that is it. I have a question. Woo! Question! Oh, that's from Facebook and Facebook is going to be weird. Um, a question for you guys. Do you believe that the quality of live streaming influences on the followers of interaction, therefore on companies' social media strategy results? Who else? that? 75 Productions. 75 productions. It's Rafa. Do we think live streaming affects what? Do you believe the quality of live streaming influences on the followers' interaction, therefore on companies' social media strategy results? Um, I, think, I think live streaming in general is only taking on right now. I know that we've had Meerkat and Periscope and all of these different services before. But only now are we starting to really get into, into live streaming. What I think is, is worse than the quality of the stream is the promotion of the stream. If you look at our Facebook feed and our Twitter feed right now, it is inundated with lots of Mini Corp's gone live, Mini Corp's gone live, Brian's gone live, Brian's gone live, and all of that can be a little bit too intensive from a, from a social media standpoint. I think there should be a tab or there should be something. I like how Instagram Live does it where the people that are live come up at the very top with a little red circle. Um, but the constant posts because you're live is probably a little bit too much and too heavy. Um, the quality of the stream, I think, can be completely disregarded at the moment. It doesn't need to be full HD. It doesn't need to be the best, um, the best quality in the world. But what you really, really need in this context is interaction. When a person is live, they need to interact with their audience and the audience needs to interact with them. Um, so that is probably the biggest promotion that I've seen in live streaming. Live streaming rocks, it's amazing. Peace out. Okay, thank you all very much for watching. This is episode number 15. Au revoir. See you guys tomorrow.